yesterday when we were talking on WhatsApp, I showed you a chart. It was a beautiful chart. It showed that China's birth and death rate for over the last 60, 60 years. And for most of the years in China, births were always higher than death. But in 2022, something remarkable happened. China had more deaths than births. You know, in the 20th and 21st century, no superpower in the world has been able to win a single war. And what about the role of US? Because on the face of it, as an outsider, it looks like that US directly benefits from the India-China rivalry. It has become fashionable these days to speak of India and China in the same breath. But why? Are these two countries even similar? If you look at absolute numbers and allow the plain boring statistics to do the talking, you would realize that Chinese are way ahead. The nominal GDP is approximately seven times that of India. The defense budget is four times that of India. From literacy rates to per capita income to even gold medals in the Olympics, Chinese are way ahead. Today, if you were to visit Shanghai or Shenzhen, from the infrastructure to living standards, nothing looks like Delhi or Mumbai. Today, it will not be wrong to conclude that China's prosperous cities are the first world conurbations. There's absolutely no doubt that Chinese economic growth occurred at a breakneck speed. But it is to be duly noted that many necks were broken to achieve that growth. Those broken necks have been in the form of human cost. Those broken necks have been in the form of human rights abuses. Those broken necks had absolutely zero freedom. Just think about this. Tomorrow when you wake up, imagine that a ruling political party tells you that you cannot have more than one kids. Or from now on, you're entitled to have two kids. How would you feel? Forget about the common population. Think about the rich and the powerful in China. In 2020, a Chinese billionaire, Ren Chu Chang, was jailed for 18 years. Why? Because he said something that insulted the Chinese president. Jack Ma, the famed billionaire, mysteriously disappeared. Why? Because Ant Financial, a company that he was leading, became way too powerful. Of course, China has seen rapid improvements in their internet access. But what is the point of such an internet when government employs millions of cyber pillars to monitor to quote-unquote undesirable activities? China and India are not similar. Welcome to the season one of the Foreign Policy Classroom. In this podcast, I'm delighted to bring in Ambassador Anil Trikunyat from the Ministry of External Affairs. From population explosion to human rights implosion, from ancient Silk Road to polar Silk Road, this podcast is going to be a masterclass for the enthusiasts of the foreign services. Of course, there will be moments when you feel like dropping off. Why? Because we all have a penchant for a short form content. But this channel is different. This channel does not stand for ill-researched, poorly conceived, short-form content. So please watch this podcast end to end. You will realize its value only when you're done with it in its entirety. If you're struggling with time, save this podcast and come back to it later. But please do. But for now, let's go back in time to the year 1947. 1947 was the year when India was not even a republic. 1947 was the year when China was still in the throes of an uncertain civil war. 1947 was also the year when the continent of Asia had absolutely no relevance for the rest of the world. It was the year 1947 when India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru organized Asia Relations Conference. Perhaps our first Prime Minister had a different vision for the world. And Asia was a central node in that world order. Prime Minister Nehru had a conviction that together with China, India would lead the region in the new age. And why not? India and China are civilizational countries. Our two civilizations have had centuries of contact in ancient age. Chinese travelers came to Indian universities They visited Indian gods and they wrote memorable accounts of their voyages. 
Nalanda University, a university that flourished for seven centuries in India, had attracted thousands of Chinese students in the ancient age. Until 1955, when Chao and Lai visited India, he was greeted with slogans of Hindi, Chini, Bhai, Bhai. But soon, things will change. What happened? From the war in 1962 to the acrimony in the corridors of the United Nations. India does not just have a trade deficit with China, but it also has something called the trust deficit. In this episode of the Foreign Policy Classroom, we decipher those deficits and we also decipher the surpluses of the India-China relations. So sit back, relax and enjoy an absolutely thrilling episode of the Foreign Policy Classroom. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 2. So Anilji, any opening remarks or thoughts on China, on why China is important for the world and also for India? Well, as you know, one thing we need to remember is China is also a civilizational country. And India is another very historic civilization with a very different kind of a heritage. The both in the modern times do have very different political systems. The Chinese system is more totalitarian, as we know. They think it is their own democracy style. But India is the largest democracy in the world. And the Chinese policies, as far as India is concerned, have often been dictated by the consideration that India needs to be confined to South Asia. Because they fear, both in the intellectual domain and the geopolitical and the geoeconomic domain, that India is the only country, frankly, which can give them a run for their dollar or the yuan. So I think that that has been their main uh, problem. But at the same time, they also know that a certain collaboration and cooperation with India is extremely important. And as you mentioned, that we have just crossed the Chinese population. So we have become the most populous country in the world now. Although earlier it was said that by 2025 or 27, but we have been much faster. As you know, India creates an Australia every year. So uh, this is something that is on top of it. Uh, the most important thing that I feel is, of course, we can go into the history of it, that the rise of China uh, is certain to a great extent. China is trying to somehow displace the United States as the hyperpower, at least economically in the first place and subsequently militarily and technologically. These are the three areas. And those, those are the three areas that India needs to focus as well. Uh, the, even though the geopolitics of the world is changing, the superpowers are fighting among them, themselves, we might have a Cold War 2.0 kind of a scenario in which India will have a very different opening uh, and a role to play. Uh, so I think that China, China's rise, if it is benign, it will be beneficial for the world. If it is malignant, it will cause a lot of rift and friction in the world. All right. Makes a lot of sense, uh, Ambassador. So what is a hyperpower? What is a superpower? And is it even possible to have a hyperpower in the modern day world? Well, uh, what happened, as you know, in the post uh, Second World War scenario, we had a cold war where one block was led by the uh, USA, the other block led by Soviet Union. And there was a balance of power which was existing between the two. So they were, as you know, in the Cuban crisis of 1962, <clears throat> they were able to balance out. Of course, they were competing for influence and partners across the world. And that time, China was a junior partner in that sense, or not, so, not of great significance until 1970s when... Uh, Nixon went to China and opened it up to the world, the Western world especially. But then in 1980, late 80s, early 90s, we saw the Soviet Union was disintegrated. And once Soviet Union got disintegrated, then only power remained of consequence was the United States of America. Russia may have had uh, more nuclear weapons, but its economy was far too strong. It is the largest country in the world, maybe the richest country in the world. But at the same time, it has a very small population. 
and uh, technological advancements are not that great as is that of the United States of America. So the USA in the 1990s onwards started behaving in a very uh, unilateral manner. And it has the capacity to strike wherever it wants in the world, even today, despite China and the United uh, and the uh, and the Russia. But what we are we looked at, why I call it as a hyperpower, is because then it could get away with murder, and that's precisely what it did when it went into Afghanistan under the garb of uh, chasing Osama bin Laden. Uh, although you and I both know that Afghanistan. Afghan people had nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, you know, there were no Afghani. It was all Saudi nationals and they were all highly educated people. But then, the, after, but Taliban and the Afghanistan at that time uh, felt the brunt of it. But since it was projected as a fight against terrorism, the whole world stood up, including Russia and China with, and India, of course, with the, with the Americans. But they never cared until then or before that whether India suffered from uh, Pakistan tied uh, through terrorism for four decades or so. They never cared about it. It's only when 9-11 happened, they started looking at it. And even then, they were very selective. Then after 2001, they went in 2003 into Iraq by manufacturing evidence that did not exist. So we have seen that these are the kind of things, and even Bosnia, or different areas, so they could go and get away with impunity. And that's what the hyperpower is all about. Now, the, uh, Russia was another superpower because it had the nuclear power, it had the missile capabilities, it had the strike capability to reverse uh, the course of any war, uh, which has been proved uh, rather uh, short-sighted what has happened in Ukraine uh, by the U Russian leadership. Because the, And I, I want to tell you something to all your uh, uh, listeners, a very interesting observation, and I think those, if they are the IR students, uh, they should try to study it. You know, in the 20th and 21st century, no superpower in the world has been able to win a single war. Look at China in Vietnam. Look at USA in Vietnam. Look at USA in Afghanistan. Very recently, they had to ignominiously exit from there. Look at Soviet Union in Afghanistan. They were disintegrated completely after that war. Look at Russia in Ukraine. So all this gives you even though there is a, this facade of the superpower status of dislocation and disruption of the international order, what you can see is that they are not definitely able to win the peace or even a war. They can create disruption, they can create destruction and sustain their own military industrial complex. So that's precisely what these countries have been doing and that's what we are looking at. <clears throat> so I think that India has a very different kind of a model in this whole thing. India's model is they want to become a Vishwaguru. They are today, despite the pandemic, as you know, there were these two black swan events. One was the pandemic, the other was this Russia-Ukraine war, which has further decimated Russia as a superpower. And because, see, what happens is it is also the perception of others. It's not only that you have the superpower unless you have exercised it. And we have seen in the history of last uh, 80, 60, 70 years, that whenever the superpower has tried to browbeat a country and has lost, then it has lost its prestige as well. You know, so that is very much there. Even though you have a firepower, you cannot be decisive. So what it conveys, it conveys that the world needs to learn to live with each other, try to minimize the uh, disruptions due to the geopolitics or the geoeconomics mm -hmm. as it plays out. And... Uh, so in, in this case, what is India doing? India is trying to strengthen its power, the hard power, and is trying to project its soft power. So while it can protect itself against any invasion, or like we have seen in Galwan, after post-Galwan, the Indian forces have been standing on the Chinese border with eye to eye border. There are discussions going on. Diplomacy dialogue is still prevalent there. But China knows that it cannot overrun India or it cannot just browbeat India. That's not. But at the same time, India is creating new alliances, new uh, friendships, new groupings, uh, in order to continue its expense overseas. So that's the difference. On the other hand, USA is trying to contain China. Very similar Indo-Pacific. They think that this is going to have a very large impact uh, on whatever happens in the region. 
China is right. So they are trying to contain it. But in my view, um, this is just delaying rather than containing. Well said. And if we were to go back in history and relive through the corridors of history, we realize that the greatest economic prosperity was achieved, not during the times of conflicts and wars, but during the age of peace. Abbasids in West Asia to Roman Empire to Han Dynasty to Gupta Empire to even modern day the US, at least the immediate neighborhood of the US is very peaceful in the backyard of Canada. So why is it that India and China, despite their neighbors, they have so much of acrimony, so much of tensions um, amongst the two? What's the reason? Well, I think the reason is this today. Again, <clears throat> it is uh, the the political system is so very different. The emphasis on things is, you see, the economy, everybody needs a good economy, a, a strong economy uh, to be able to excel in the global affairs. It's important. If you don't have economy, you don't have military power, you cannot dictate yourself. You can just make voices, go and make noises at the United Nations Security Council or the, no, or the United Nations, but that would mean nothing. Frankly, so there need to be a power to reckon. You need to be a strategic location, which India is for that matter. China itself is like that in that situation. So China first very smartly tried to enhance, with the help of the Americans of the West, its economic power. It remained under the radar. It did not confront the Western countries with whose help it was working. Earlier it was Soviet Union, then it moved on with the, with the Western countries since Kissinger's famous visit took place and then the Nixon's in the 70s. So since then, they continued to be all right. There was a, a some kind of a competition, but at the same, or concern about the Chinese practices, the human rights violations and things like that in the West, but the economy prevailed. You talked about the, the, the it is not absolutely true that the economies prosper only in the, in the times of peace. It depends on the nature of the economy. The U.S. economy is driven purely by its military-industrial complex. And the military-industrial complex of the United States is, has benefited a great deal from Second World War. Thereafter, the fears of the various countries. For example, listen, Saudi Arabia happens to be the largest importer of the weapons in the, from the United States. Largest. India is the second or third largest today. India is the third largest importer of uh, first, I mean, the largest importer of the Russian arms ammunition. So these countries thrive. And for that, what do you need? You need conflict. So they don't need peace, they need conflict, these superpowers. China also has a very similar kind of a periphery. Why it is at the moment not going all out for war is simply it wants to buy the time. And we need to be careful about it. Because it is trying to buy the time so that it can have its backyard perfect, its gray zone warfare techniques extremely well oiled. It buys the media around the world to create a, some kind of a narrative, which it has done. We have heard about it. It is also trying to become militarily very strong and technologically superior. Now, that takes time. So it is buying time. It doesn't want to go with India to war. It doesn't want to go with the United States directly for the war unless they create conditions like were done in the Ukraine war. If they create same conditions in Taiwan, obviously China will go to war. And China and US will have then direct confrontation, which will be disastrous for the world. Now, China and India's thing is that, as I mentioned earlier, now, you know, we have become the largest market if you come to think of it. We are the fastest growing economy. China has slowed down significantly since then. China is facing more headwinds as far as its trade relations with the West is concerned. It is the fifth, five times bigger economy than us because we started economic reform much less. Our domestic policies have to be, in my view, uh, accused of complicity or, uh, or something called, uh, I, I would say, it, uh, inaction. Uh, to, it's only in 1991 that we were forced to go in for economic reforms, not by our choice, but because of the Gulf Wars and the oil crisis that happened and balance of payment crisis that India faced. But that's something that could happen to India. 
So since then, we have done remarkably well. And also, I must say, the Prime Minister Modi has been trying in his last 10 years, has done amazingly well as far as doing business with India, uh, removing 1,500 odd or I don't know how many hundreds of laws, archaic laws have been removed. DBI index has gone up. FDI has increased tremendously. So today, the world is looking at a choices to be made. <clears throat> After this competition has begun between Sino-US, uh, China and the United States. So we followed the policy of competition with cooperation. So China happens to be our largest trading partner or the, no, the US and China between them. Despite the fact that India tried to ban the apps, control their investments or the trade, everything, it has become the highest ever. And the deficit in China is immense. So that is the economic domain. Though even we would like to branch off somehow or lessen our dependence on China. But if the world has been trying to integrate in the past 70 years in the economic domain so that the one country's you know, the, the interdependencies have increased, which is termed as global and value supply chains. So global and value supply chains are dispersed. For making one vaccine, you needed some uh, uh, things from 38, 34 uh, sources. Now, even if, for we are the pharmacy of the world, but we depend depend for 70 to 80 percent for IPIs from China. So you can imagine that these are things, situations where we have to acquire this at Nirvar Bharat thing that has begun. It is not the first time. We had Swadeshi movement many, many years ago. Uh, before this, then we had uh, India May self-reliance, which just started. But this particular Abhinavar Bharat is for making India for the world. Like it is trying to get into the global and value supply chain part. And that's where China feels that India can give them a much bigger competition. Uh, just to correct my, my thoughts, um, what I meant was that War is good for the economy as long as you're not participating in it. The U.S. economy grew whenever it was detached from those wars. Yeah. So, but perhaps instigation of wars definitely benefited those, benefited those economies. But uh, in terms of, uh, but when if you look at India and China, they've had major conflicts and many minor conflicts, uh, even in 21st century. So what are the reasons for those conflicts? I think that uh, the, the Chinese, uh, in my view, are suspect of Indian motives, always suspicious uh, that India probably could become a part of the Western alliance system. It feels threatened from the West. That's one reason, very clear. Secondly, they know that India's soft power is far more superior to the Chinese despite the fact that they are also an ancient civilization. They're trying to correct it, no doubt about it. But they do understand that. And you know that the, when the debate between hard power and soft power goes on, we always see that soft power is enduring in a very long term. Right? So, But at the same time, then China also has its own, after the Tibet thing, you know that. Uh, and uh, of course, the Britishers, the kind of lines they, they drew and all. Now, we have seen that the war happened between India and China because of the, uh, the Tibetan uh, cause, the Lai Lama is one of the causes that they feel is India is trying to provoke them. And we gave the, uh, we welcomed the Lai Lama when he was here, uh, came in to India in 1953. So this is one of the reasons that they always remain uh, suspicious. Secondly, as I mentioned, that India's military power, even if today it doesn't match to theirs, but is significant enough because we have fought several wars since our independence. And most of the times we have come out winning. A 1962 war with China, when Prime Minister Nehru actually thought that it was China will never attack India. It was his belief in pragmatism, you can say, or idealism, whatever it is. He thought that China, we have helped China, we work closely with China, it will not happen. But that broke him, broke him, frankly. And Chinese wanted more territory, you know. And they feel that this territory, like a Arunachal claim, Arunachal, they call part of Tibet, they will call of Ladakh and everything, is that area they want. So there is this territorial dispute. And China is one country which may have territories with 14, 15 countries, but it has territorial disputes with 24 countries. 
So China's hegemonistic and expansionist designs are the ones that create these kind of conflicts. Secondly, it does not respect the agreements that it has signed. Dr. Jashankar has said many times, when and after Rahul Gandhi, uh, Rajiv Gandhi went to uh, China, we signed an agreement as re-established diplomatic relations as, at the ambassador level. Thereafter, several agreements, 93 and others, have been signed with China, but they, they have not respected them. The border uh, was supposed to be, uh, of course, for 40 years it, it went off without any major incident, which is a good thing. It was lasting. It was only in 2020 that they really uh, tried to probably challenge the Indians. And they got worried about because India was earlier not that much bothered about creating infrastructure on the border. But once India started creating infrastructure, um, the, the airports and whatnot for uh, counterattacks and to safeguard our territory, then obviously the, the Chinese took that uh, as some kind of a challenge to them. And they wanted to acquire these strategic positions with vis-a-vis -vis India. And that's how, why there, there it stands. Now, despite the 17, 18 meetings that have happened at the border level and WMCC and all, but we are not seeing uh, uh, a, a movement. So China feels, in my view, that for their regional influence, India is the biggest threat, despite the fact that Xi Jinping said that there is enough space in South Asia for India and China. But I feel that this competition is going to continue to be accentuated. They are trying to go through their uh, something called a string of pulse strategy in the region with our neighbors. Everywhere they try to go and prop up something which is which then uh, goes against India's interests. So India has the historic connection with all our neighbors, but at the same time we see that China is trying to make a great ingress because of their debt diplomacy, because of their wool warrior diplomacy, and because of their um, you know quick uptake on opportunities, which is what something is lacking in India. You know we are not able to. Uh, do things with a speed and uh, and take decisions rather quickly. And that is what China has capitalized on in our neighborhood and elsewhere, which is, so I personally feel um, that China will remain a permanent challenge for India in every geography. And what about the role of US? Because on the face of it, as an outsider, it looks like that US directly benefits from the India-China rivalry. Is that the well, case? I, yeah. You see, the USA is, uh, uh, until, as I said, was a hyperpower, but it is being challenged by China. So it wants to contain China in the Indo-Pacific itself. In Indo-Pacific, we all know how important uh, this has become, the two oceans. Countries, whether Japan, Korea, ASEAN countries, you are now in Thailand sitting there. You know, every country has uh, concerns about the Chinese growth and the way China is going to go. Even though the Chinese have changed a little, tweaked a bit their uh, economy. They want to become number one power by 2049. That is their objective. Now, how do you become power by that means? It is like the old kings, you know, emperors, when they wanted to go send a horse everywhere. And if you so, just everybody succumbs to them and uh, salutes them, and then they are okay with it. But that's not happening. They're there, and America is sitting on the other hand. They want to have their own horses out. So, we are seeing that problem happening. So, when the competition... Now, the United States also changed its policy a few years ago. When they started, which is called Pivot to South Asia, or Pivot to Asia, then they converted Asia-Pacific into Indo-Pacific in the first place. Their own command into Indo-Pacific, trying to drag India into it, right? The Quad has come in. It was reactivated from 2017 onwards. Several meetings, including summits, have happened. <clears throat> but each one is on a different track. They know it very well, that if they want to contain China in the region, they need India. So that's where the United States, which until... Uh, 70s, 80s had been virtually anti-India. You know, in 71, what happened? We have seen it uh, when uh, the, the Fifth Fleet came into our region in favor of Pakistan. So they have supported Pakistan, China, all those countries that are enemies of India, anyway. And, and then 
they expected India to become just because we are a democracy and the value systems are similar and all that, that to be stand with them whenever they want it. So same thing applies to the Europeans. And that's why when Dr. Jashankar very rightly said that uh, Europe thinks it's the center of the world and their, their problems should be the problems of the world. So India looks at it differently now, the whole of global geopolitics. It's carving out its own role. And that's what I think is uh, a concern for the Chinese. And they think that India, beyond a point, they are already having a problem with the United States. So in a changing scenario which is emerging, uh, I think that uh, India has a very critical and crucial role in both the U.S. and the Chinese strategies. Yeah. Yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. And so yesterday when we were talking on WhatsApp, I showed you a chart. It was a beautiful chart. It showed that China's birth and death rate for over the last 60, 60 years. And for most of the years in China, births were always higher than death. But in 2022, something remarkable happened. China had more deaths than births. So what it means that in the, for the first time in Chinese history, its population is on a decline. In fact, it is projected that China's population will shrink to nearly half of what it is right now by the end of uh, the century. What could this mean for India and also for the world? Well, I think that uh, the, the chart that you're showing and the this is uh, that's what the concern of the uh, CPC was, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, you know, they that's why they have come up with a new policy that people should have three children. I remember visiting China many times, and I know that uh, at that time there was single China policy, single child policy, and uh, anything else you need to get permissions, otherwise you will be punished, and fines, huge fines were put on all. So they wanted to control the population. Now, there is a natural cycle of the population, as we all know. Um, and so today, while India is going ahead with this two-two child policy maximum, the more education happens, the more the uh, prosperity increases, you will see that there are less number of children are produced uh, by middle classes, which is growing in India, for example, is 600 odd million. So they don't like to have many children because they can't provide for them. So that's an economic reason for this. The state was discouraging having greater families for most of the people. So China has come to that point today. Secondly, in 2022, as you know, due to the pandemic also, they had huge number of deaths which have been reported, not reported. Uh, they have been discussed uh, everywhere. But this decline of population is very much evident in whole of Europe, growing of the population. China is going through its natural progression. It is trying to retrieve it. It's not possible. India will continue to grow until 2050. And after that, we'll also have the similar situation. This, this demographic dividend will reduce substantially. We'll have a great population. Then we will have Africa as the next frontier for growth of population, which will be 1.5 uh, billion by then. So or maybe more uh, by 2050. But these are the three geographies where you will have population. I mean, you know, Russia is 140 million, which is nothing. United States is about 300 million also, not too much, if they don't have so much of immigration and all. So that's why a lot of countries are looking for immigration in, in different parts. So it is a challenge. It is a very major challenge for China because it will reduce the market size. It will reduce the availability of labor on which it counted uh, to produce, become a manufacturing hub of the world. Now, that is something that is changing. But then China is also changing its policies. It's going more towards the technology upgradation uh, due to the use of technology. So tomorrow's thing, robots, AI, quantum, and all those uh, major things are going to dictate the world we live in. I mean, we had heard, we had seen Star Wars. That's kind of coming true uh, to a great extent now. So I think that this is a major challenge for China, but it is a good opportunity for India. At the same time, it is also a very major challenge because if you have people below the age of 30, 70 percent of your population, you got to provide for them. The economy must be able to sustain that for which you need 8 to 10 percent long term growth. And if you don't have that, then you will have a very major problem with regard to your youth population. Instead of becoming dividend, it becomes um, a, 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 some kind of a brag for you. So I think that that is a challenge that needs to be. So China is trying to retrieve it, but it's unlikely that they will be able to do that. 
so it has its own physical and psychological uh, barriers and challenges when we see a country losing its population i have been to russia and many times and i see that they 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 their largest country in the world one seventh of the whole world but at the same time they have very little population so in many places you will not find any people for example the border on the far east the chinese are all over so this is something that is going to happen this is natural in as the economic progression or growth takes place uh, the populations usually tend to be less china perhaps it was not natural there were a lot of interventions by the government they officially did. Uh, official policy was one child policy they wanted to just have a replacement one by one yeah so there But, was no provision for uh, a, a, a bigger reduction uh, in the and system and there's so many news outlets from cnn to even india media outlets they have been terming this to be an indian decade or perhaps indian century how true would that be and because basis the the statistics what we realize is that india's population today is four times larger than the, than the us on the other hand us is three times more larger in size than than india and this has led to a lot of problems for india from resource management to infrastructure to so on and so forth to cut throat competition various examinations but um what are those news outlets uh, when are they also analyzing the impact of uh, the enormous growing population of india well as i said just now that uh, the growing population has its own challenges uh, for which the economy has to increase and the economy does not increase in size or value in vacuum it increases when the other economies are also growing so the growth of the economy in today's world is quite interdependent now that's what causes opportunities like for example when we are looking for foreign direct investment or technologies and all uh, to be brought into india uh, then obviously we are looking to create a great opportunities employment opportunities for our people to make them better health for them other facilities that people require the, the population because india is also looking to become by 2047 a developed country Uh, that's what is the aim so once your economy today which is now 3.2 3.3 trillion dollars uh, said to be 5 trillion by 2025 or 26 if it by 2030 let's say uh, 2047 it become 30 or 35 trillion then obviously it will create greater opportunities uh, for this but then it is not a straight road very often the growth is a sine curve so it is you know man never know how the global i mean pandemic nobody believed That there would be pandemic. Russia-Ukraine war was hardly anticipated, you know, and so that happens. Even if we don't know in China, if the implosion in China takes place, for example, internal contradictions there are plenty of them there. That will change the whole complex of the global this thing. Likewise, if India is not able to provide for its growing uh, and multiplying population, uh, which will become youth, and the dividend is then the youth dividend can be a drag for you, as I said. so it could be a problem so there are many imponderable factors but as it may be like now currently as we see the india's trajectory as far as coming out of the pandemic unscathed frankly to a great extent as far as economic concern the largest uh, the, the uh, fastest growing major economy in the world at 7% or something like that it is to grow at 8 to 10% uh, in order to be able to keep pace with what we want to achieve then there should be no war there should be peace that's very important that's not in only our hands that's in the hands of others also then the, the global scenario must be more positive you know the economic growth now today the world economic growth has been reduced substantially by various agencies including the world bank and others from 3.8 to 2.6 or 7 so if that happens then obviously where are you going to grow you have to grow with the world the world economy has to grow in order for your economy to grow right even though we can say that we are the largest consumer base Uh, we are the bigger all these things. So all these things are uh, factors. Some are for us to manage within India through pol- right kind of robust policies, making India more attractive than others. Like many companies that want to leave China, they should be able to come. Today you are the largest exporter of iPhones, uh, which is a great achievement. Samsung makes the biggest factory here uh, in India. So there are a lot of things, but we need to also advance ourselves technologically. we have this great it human resource in india 
Now, that human resource needs to be plowed for the India of tomorrow that we are looking at. Basis your work across the globe as a diplomat and basis your understanding of India and working for India, what are the three, four biggest challenges that India is facing or could face in time to come? These could be internal, could be external. Uh, well, um, as you know that uh, when you grow in the international stretcher, uh, you do come across many uh, challenges. Uh, apart from the standard challenges of attracting investments, technology, and others, uh, in your democracy, you need to be what you project abroad. So the internal dissensions need to be reduced. Uh, if there are any flagrant violations, uh, they need to be contained. It's important. So that the message that goes out is that you are truly what you are saying you are. That's important. So that narrative building is very important. Unfortunately, India has not succeeded in narrative building. And for narrative building, what you need is, in my view, an excellent and effective communication strategy in which you should have all your soft power, in which you should have all the uh, diplomatic prowess which is called a smart power anyway. So you should be able to project that. We have not done that as yet. But we have been, I would say, by default, we have gained tremendous prominence in the world today for three reasons. One is India follows this policy of a strategic autonomy, which in some form existed as non-alignment. But today it is a strategic autonomy, means you're making strategic choices and partners, not alliances. And secondly, what you are trying to do is show to the world that you are the biggest opportunities. I always say that country of India's size, today the largest population, going to be the biggest market. The country where the economic opportunities are immense, which is the largest democracy which is located at strategically should be able to encash that advantage to your advantage while dealing with the all superpowers or other powers in the world. I don't see that we have done that significantly. Our power increased, so our influence has tremendously increased in India in the last few years, I would say. Why? Pandemic time, you did something that no other country wanted to do. Everybody else was storing vaccines and you went out with your vaccines and providing to the those who are needy in Africa, some hundred odd countries. You went around giving medicines to only 50 countries. What has it created? It created that India is a country that stands in times of need without any colonial sort of an objective, which other powers have. So it has given you a standalone opportunity to be reckoned with in the international discourse. Everybody looks at you. I remember when I was at Oxford and when we did our nuclear tests, all my friends from the developing countries, the Global South has it is called, in Oxford, they were so happy. They said, we are happy that India has done it. Not because India is aggressive. Unlike China, unlike US, unlike Russia. There's a great difference in our people. And that's what is our strength also. Secondly, our HADR capabilities, as it is called, we have become the first responder uh, in any situation in the world. Right, we are today, we went to Turkey and Syria to provide them immediate relief. Our forces and our uh, the people went there and just, which was not there. Turkey, we don't have a great relationship. But despite that, we did that. In our neighborhood, we were the first ones to provide anything, be it Nepal, Sri Lanka, or anywhere else. So this is something that is going on, and this needs to be built upon a little more, that you are there. Of course, today we have a G20 presidency. We are having the presidency of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We'll be holding the India-Africa Forum Summit. 
We are also the chair of the Vasimar arrangement today. Now, with all these, you are getting that. But then the West, what it wants to do that now today, there is another game plan which is going on to destabilize India. Khalistan movement, support to Khalistan by various governments in the West, especially trying to provide them the forums to have referendums. I mean, these, these are designs. These are not something that is happening sui generis. And we need to be careful about it. And that's why I said the communication strategy is extremely important to what you want to say. And say in one voice. That's very important. Then you are also having problems. Suddenly you will come out of human rights violations or democracy deficit in India. Now, these are something they are not the gospel or the truth, but they are so effectively communicated in this gray zone warfare kind of a thing, where we, we can't be caught unawares. Because see, in a democracy, media is also reasonably free. When it is free, it talks, people understand, and then your, uh, your uh, I, I would say, negotiability with regard to something larger interest reduces because then you land up in firefighting at home. So the, the domestic policy very much impacts your foreign policy. And so whatever you're going to do, do that. Now, becoming a member of the UN Security Council, we are talking of reforms and reforms and reforms. But who are we talking to? We are talking to the same people who don't want the reforms to happen. P5 countries. Indiv individually, they will tell you, Oh, USA stands with India, France stands with India, UK stands with India. We want you in Russia. We'll say that China will say we are looking at it. But none of them wants the reform to take place or give up their veto power. So it is not going to happen. You have to work with the other countries who are not these five countries if you want things changing. Or the UN system, a multilateral trading system, everything becomes irrelevant. So we must spearhead that campaign. Terrorism, same thing. So I think that I would say that we need to, uh, same thing applies to uh, economic reforms. You know, wherever there is the problem, Prime Minister Modi very rightly says that we are going to provide red carpet and the red tape, which is an important thing. When India uh, reforms, the world transforms. Those are the kind of things. We want to become part of the global value supply chain. We were not there anywhere in the world. We were not part of any global value supply chain, despite being an IT power or a knowledge economy. Those are the things we need to look at. It. We need to be, we have no R&D in India, very, very little. You know, you are the country, 2000 years ago, you gave knowledge to the world, you created knowledge. But then we don't have that. That is something that we need to get back and do it. If we had not created zero or one like the numbers, then you would not have this IT revolution happening around the world because it's based on that, binaries. So this is something that we need to do. That's one of the biggest challenge India has is to invest in R&D, which I call as innovation. It is very important to have innovation. Innovation, startup nation, that we call it. So, I mean, we are doing there. We are getting there gradually, but it's a bit already late in the day. And so I think your point about communication strategy is very relevant. I think Rajiv Malhotra recently spoke about this and wrote a detailed book on uh, on how certain education institutes, I, I was at Harvard, and how the courses are being formulated, especially in the Kennedy School, about uh, about how India should rise and how, how what is happening in India, basically. So... Um, there are few professors who are sponsored and who are holding the chair in in the Harvard that are who are in a way promulgating ideas that may not be in line with the uh, what India would ideally want. So, in terms of communication strategy, what should be India's strategy, and how should uh, India go about building one? Well, there are many. First thing you need to be clear what you want to convey. You see goal and objective, and the, any strategy, communication strategy. What is most important is that. Then you have to identify who are the real actors and what is your target clientele. Once you are clear about it, you need to learn that the, what are the actors in this whole game. Media is it. <clears throat> now, Western media is always looking at India in a very negative manner. And it is not something that, that exists, but it is by design because they have the power media. You need to create now within India also, there are media as 
very often trying to just talk about some small incident that happened and think that it is a very big incident, make it out. And then you know, don't have to go outside when they are attacking you on human rights because your own ecosystem is providing that information to them. So we need to take care of that. That's why when I said is we need to be what we want to project because otherwise the bubble will be burst after some time. It happened with China, with other countries. It has happened, you know. So you are looking at it in that way. The secondly, your soft power tools, they need to be honed up so that people know it. And when they think about India, I was at Udaipur the other day and there was the three ambassadors who were speaking. And we the, the name of the panel, we read India in the eyes of others. And one of the ambassadors who became so Greek ambassador, actually, he became so moved when he said, he said, when I look at uh, USA, I think of Iraq or Afghanistan. When I look at China, I look at Uyghurs. When I look at India, I'm thought, I think of Mother India. Full movie. And he started crying. You know, so unless you have that kind of a thing, because there are individual people who may love India, who may like India, but then there are the state moves that operate us. So you need to do that. Then, for example, in India, for instance, I mean, I would say, and I have always been saying, and I have no hesitation in telling here also in this. I hope somebody reads it and listens. You know, with on these Indian TV channels, even I go sometimes. There are 30, 40, 50 people from defense forces, from the diplomats, ex-diplomats, some top politicians, some others. Politicians leave them aside. But I'm talking of the professionals who go on TV channels and debates. Today, there's no news, only debates. Right, and this becomes sensational all the time. So without taking any political side, you can be objective. To be objective, you need to have right information. When you cull out information from the newspapers, you are rattling it out there itself with half-baked information. Then obviously you are not doing service to the country. Then though everybody is watching you. Chinese are very much monitoring. Americans are monitoring media, everything. They get their information from here. So what, what could be government do? Government could create some kind of an agency, maybe Defense Ministry, External Affairs Ministry together, because today defense diplomacy is one thing. You brief these fellows. They are at the end of the day ex-government officers. They are invited uh, by various channels to tell them that what is the truth. What is where are we heading, rather than simply speculating. Very often that's what happens. The biggest thing you know about this war, Russia-Ukraine war, the information warfare. Because, see, the information warfare or disinformation campaigns are a reality that is that hurts you much more than the actual war. Oh, that's beautifully said. A uh, couple of points I would want to speak of before we end this beautiful podcast. The first is uh, about the Arctic. I think uh, for the first time in human history, something remarkable is happening over there. In 2017, we saw that the Russian oil tanker traveled across the Arctic without needing the icebreaker. And that's a huge deal because the journey that took approximately 19 days from Asia to Europe, I think 48 days from Asia to Europe, is now taking 19 days. And uh, it is an emergence of a new ocean route that we've never had before. We've seen during the pandemic how the how the delays were caused because of these shipping routes from Suez Canal to Malacca to Panama. But now that could be circumnavigated. Uh, in this context, what is India doing? Because we see China's policy being very aggressive in the, in the Arctic. Um, how important is Arctic and what is India's position there? Well, number one is very unfortunate uh, that what you mentioned is happening is because of the climate change. This is a direct result of that. Secondly, the most important thing is that this is an extremely rich region of the world unexplored so far, be it minerals, be it oil and gas and all. And that's why all these powers are moving in there. The USA and Russia have been essentially the arbiter of that area. And of course, Nordic countries are involved in that. There is an Arctic Council, which has not met since the Russia-Ukraine war has impacted that. We have seen this. The problem that is there is China obviously wants to go wherever resources are, be it Africa, be it Latin America, be it, you know, so it chooses to be there and it is a power. It is flexing its power 
that we can reach everywhere. They are building a blue water navy all over. So they can go there, they can have, they are focusing on science and technology with the immense stick. So China says that, look, I'm also, as you said, polar, polar uh, Silk Road or whatever. So they say that we are very much part of it and we want to be part of it. And if this war turns the way Russia-Ukraine war turns into a Cold War 2.0, then you have Russia and China very much being part together in that place. India also announced, I think two years ago, its Arctic policy. And India's Arctic policy has been virtually for expedition in one way. With the Russians, with the Americans, we know we are part of the actually observer of the concept, uh, the Arctic Council. So India is counted there very much. But we have been into the, uh, so far, have been uh, doing a lot of research uh, in the area, you know, and our own uh, vessels have gone there and done the research. So that's what everybody else was doing it. But when it comes to exploitation of the resources, I think that there will be a greater strategic competition that will begin among various powers. And until and unless they are about to have some kind of a, a new Arctic treaty in which uh, there are certain rules are framed, especially the rules uh, and international order, you are going to have it as a major zone of competition. Like, for example, with Russia, we have started a new trading route, Chennai to Vladivostok, if you remember, from the Far East. And that will take you very close. So I think that we are working on it, and uh, India is engaging with all the partners in that. But at the moment, because of the Russia-U.S. competition uh, in the Ukraine uh, landscape, uh, is holding back everything. Interesting. And uh, and if we were to summarize the entire India-China relations, uh, in by looking at four or five key trends that have driven the entire relation, what would those four or five key events would be that? the viewers should be aware of? Well, number one is um, the China's hegemonistic policy. Uh, and as uh, I would just quote Dr. Jashanka, that if we want to, uh, we are meeting them. I mean, you know that we are part of the RIC, part of BRICS, part of SCO. Bilaterally also, the minister was here in the G20 uh, foreign minister's meeting. Uh, Jashankar met him. Uh, so interactions are going on. We follow this policy of competition with cooperation. China overtly says that India and China have a great future ahead and all that. But that's wrong. Strategically, realistically thinking, you need to have a little passive view of the Chinese policy. Because China is trying to contain India within the region. That's very important through our encircling our neighborhood. Even in the Middle East, we are going to have the same problem. Now, um, the I think the other thing is that as long as China, three M's, I was going to tell you, the mutual sensitivity, the mutual interest, and mutual respect. So these are the three things, unless they are there in any relationship, it cannot move forward in a positive way. The only way out then is confrontation, conflict, which is what both countries are trying to avoid at this stage. But it is not something that is can be only one country can do it, unless it surrenders, which India will not. So I think that this, these are the issues and we need to be, I say in one word, as I always say, and uh, you can expand it to the extent that China is going to be India's challenge in every geography as we grow in stature. Oh, fantastic. Uh, that's it uh, from my end. Any last thoughts or words for the, for the viewers, Ambassador? Well, I think that we need to, well, the viewers, I would request them to, if they, they, uh, they, they read, uh, they, whatever they read, they must read and analyze and check facts uh, before believing or moving forward with any particular narrative. That is very important because, as I mentioned about the gray zone warfare or disinformation campaigns, they are a reality today. They are presented to like the 419 scams. So one has to be very careful uh, in making, and even when you read anything in Indian media, double check the facts. And simply Googling everything does not really help. Very well. I think, yeah, I totally concur with your views that uh, the news that we see are views. So it should be taken with a huge grain of salt. And I do diligence should be undertaken to further analyze it. Thank you so much yes. for your time. 
Thank uh, you. Thank you. You have a wonderful day ahead in Delhi and look forward to the next you episode. You too and enjoy your, your trip. Of course. Take care. All the very best. Bye-bye. Thank you.